Welcome to class, everyone. My name is Jessica, and I'm a senior at UNC. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm also a senior at UNC. Hi, my name is Jacob, and I'm also a senior at UNC. Hi, my name is Kendall. I'm a junior at UNC. All right, I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to get started with our video about dopamine. Welcome to the lecture. I'm super excited to learn with you today. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. We're gonna start with a quiz. So click on this link and don't forget to record your score so that you can compare how you did at the beginning of the video to the end. Great, thank you guys. So why does dopamine matter? besides this really funny meme. It has so many functions in the brain and body. It's secreted by the midbrain and it's essential, especially in movement of the body. For example, in Parkinson's disease, in cells that produce dopamine, if they die, it'll lead to tremors, difficulty speaking and difficulty walking. Dopamine is also involved in our reward pathways, which you're probably familiar with. In drugs like heroin, it'll increase the amount of dopamine in the reward pathway, which results in pleasure. This dopamine pathway is the reason that drugs are so addictive. It's also really important in these other areas like memory, behavior and cognition, attention, sleep, mood, and learning. How does dopamine accomplish all these things? With receptors in your neurons. So many of you are likely already familiar with the lock and key model for receptor binding. This model suggests that ligands act like a key, which fits perfectly into the receptor in order to activate and open an ion channel in the receptor. However, this understanding of receptors is overly simplistic. So today we'll be looking at D1 and D5 receptors as a more complex model of how receptor binding actually occurs. Both D1 and D5 are G protein coupled receptors. receptors. DPCRs have seven transmembrane domains, which are actually made of alpha helices, spirals of amino acid chains that span the membrane of the cell. However, this model is still simplistic. DPCRs actually look more like the second image, but let's break down the mechanism so we can understand what goes on when dopamine binds. Attached to the receptor is a G protein, which is a protein complex made of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. The inactive alpha subunit binds to GDP. When a ligand or neurotransmitter, in this case dopamine, binds to the GPCR, it induces a conformational change or shape change in the protein. This change is due to the protein subunits being pushed into a new position. New bonds in the proteins are being formed or broken, and sometimes ions are added or removed from the complex. Next, the G protein dissociates from the receptor. The alpha subunit dissociates from the beta and gamma complexes when dopamine binds. And BB GDP is an exchange for GTP. After dopamine binding, the activated alpha subunit dissociates and binds to the enzyme adenosine cyclase. This enzyme converts ATP into cyclic AMP, which is a secondary messenger that causes many intracellular processes to occur. Thus, dopamine receptors may take longer to actually affect the brain compared to ion channels, which are typically more of the lock and key idea, but they still have a wide, wide spread effect. So now let's watch a video that shows the mechanism for all this. We have a general model of dopamine receptor, the G protein coupled receptor or GPCR. The general mechanism for GPCRs is that an extracellular ligand binds to an extracellular binding site of the GPCR. This induces a conformational change within the receptor, which recruits an intracellular G protein composed of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. Upon binding to the GPCR, GDP bound to the alpha subunit of the G protein is replaced by GTP, which causes the beta activated alpha subunit to dissociate from the GPCR and beta gamma dimer. These two activated G protein complexes go on to amplify an intracellular signal, which was originally induced by a neurotransmitter ligand.
So now, there are actually five different types of dopamine receptors found in humans. The D1 and D5 receptors are unique from other types of dopamine receptors, in both structure and function. When D1 and D5 are bound to dopamine, they activate a G protein, which eventually leads to an increase in CAMP. D2 and D3 and D4, on the other hand, inhibit the formation of CAMP when they are activated by, activated by the binding of dopamine. Structurally, D2, D3, and D4 have a larger intracellular three loop than D1 and D5. While D1 and D5 receptors have a similar structure and are more closely related to each other than to D2, D3, or D5, there are some differences between the two receptors. First, D1 receptors are much more abundant than D5. They're also comprised of different sequences and amino acids. The D5 receptor also contains more amino acids than the D1 receptor. The D5 receptor has 477 amino acids, while the D1 receptor only has 466 amino acids. Additionally, the third cytoplasmic loop of the D1 receptor is larger than that of the D5. Finally, the D5 receptor has a longer uh, C terminal than D1. Now, Dopamine is not the only thing that binds to dopamine receptors. An agonist is a molecule that activates the receptor. Each agonist binds slightly differently to the pocket, so each agonist also confers different actions. Some may bind tightly and cause great activation, while others bind for a short time before popping out. Great, it's gonna get even more complicated, so enjoy the ride. Okay, um, so positive allosteric modulators, big words, they increase the effectiveness of dopamine agonist or dopamine itself by changing the shape of the receptor so that the ligand binds tighter or is more likely to bind. Negative allosteric modulators are the same as PAMPs, but they decrease the binding affinity of the agonist, which decreases the activity of the GPCR. So you might be wondering why we care about this. Um, there are plenty of clinical implications um, NAMs and PAMs, as we call them, can both be used as drugs to help treat psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia because they make it easier for dopamine to bind or more importantly, inhibit its ability to bind. Agonists like levodopa have been used in the past to treat Parkinson's disease and restore movement, but it comes with major side effects. We're done, right? Nope, there's actually more to these interactions. So there are also different ways that ligand binding interactions modulate brain activity like dimerization in which receptors bind to each other and the function of one or both of the receptors is altered. So now you guys can take the quiz again and record your score and then you can let us know if you have any questions, but thank you for coming and look at how, project, how much progress you've made in understanding the brain. All right, thanks everyone, bye.